Good evening, everyone. So today, we'll mostly talk about the future during this third century of Harvard Medical School. But I start with something that happened decades ago to a young diabetes researcher working down in Washington at the NIH. At the time, his research group was baffled. They had identified a desperately ill group of diabetic patients who didn't respond to any dose of insulin that their doctors administered. And nobody could figure it out. But unless they did, these patients would likely die. One day, the young researcher had an idea. He told his mentor, some of these patients have autoimmune features. They produce unusual antibodies. Could one of these antibodies prevent insulin from acting by attaching to insulin receptors on their cells? He truly feared his boss might say, ridiculous. But instead, he said, wow, you, you're the first to suggest that idea. Why don't you go test it? So the next night, after doing a quickly designed experiment, this researcher sat alone in a little room besides the gamma counter, and he waited for it to spit out his data, and he was both thrilled and terrified. Now, by now, you've probably guessed that that young researcher was me. <laughs> uh, I had gone to medical school planning to become a practicing doctor, but I had an amazing mentor named Solomon Burson. And he was both a great doctor and a brilliant scientist. And working with him got me excited about research. In fact, in addition to learning from him, I actually dreamed of being his colleague for the rest of my life. And one day he said to me, you really should go to NIH to pursue research. And I know just who you should work with. And that comment was why, back in 1974, I was sitting in that room. No, I won't tell you right now if my research idea was right, at least not right now, but because what's really critical to understand about research is this. Not every idea pans out. They don't. But every idea, every student, every project might, and especially at Harvard Medical School where we have some of the most brilliant scientists in the world, some of the most brilliant students, the greatest teachers, the greatest medical innovators, and the great leaders of HMS, our deans, department chairs, heads of our affiliates. Here, ideas often do pan out. Now, I wish there was time for me to introduce every one of these leaders and talk about the contributions they've made, but there isn't. So in the next few minutes, I want to tell all of you about why what we do here matters, some exciting things that we will do, and why you all have the power, not just to be part of that, but to be the power behind it. Of course, you already know a lot about why what we do here matters. We see it in West Africa, where thousands of people sit home alone, waiting to die from hugging a child or wiping the face of a sick neighbor because something they cannot see and do not understand has invaded their bodies. We see it in India, where over 4,500 children younger than five will die today, mostly because they don't have clean water to drink. And we see it here in Massachusetts, where we have great hospitals and have pioneered health reform, but still have many people with inadequate health care. And we see it in this room, for with all our resources, who has not had a family member or friend diagnosed with a tumor we can't treat, or a child on the autism spectrum, or a parent who can no longer recognize us when we walk through the door? At Harvard, we ask questions that will often mean the difference between life and death. And we've been doing that for more than two centuries. We did it in 1799 when people asked, could there really be a vaccine to prevent smallpox? Well, Dr. Benjamin Waterhouse, one of the school's three co-founders, carried out an experiment, including his own family members, to show Bostonians that it could be done. And we did it in 1846, when surgery was virtually torture, and surgeons were told what they needed most was to be pitiless. People asked, wasn't there some way to make surgery painless? And in the MGH ether dome, we held the first public demonstration of anesthesia. We continue to ask questions and find answers today. We do it first through our medical students. Sometimes people actually forget that. They focus on our research. 
but I can't forget because I'm the dean of Harvard Medical School. I'm thrilled to watch our students progress from basic science to clinical exposure to the wonderful and sometimes bewildering moments when they need to decide what kind of doctors, researchers, or leaders they'll be. Now, whatever career choices our remarkable students make, their ability to enhance healthcare will depend heavily on the questions our researchers ask. So one such research question involved Alzheimer's disease. We know about beta amyloid plaques that most people believe cause this terrible disease. We also know that some people with those plaques show no cognitive decline. So how could that be? This year, our faculty member, Bruce Yankner, led a study that found one gene, the aptly named REST gene, may provide an answer. The REST gene is useful early in life, and for some it switches on again during the rest of life. And when it does, the REST gene seems to protect the brain. Bruce was the first person to identify damage done by beta amyloid. He's eager to discover more now about how this gene wards off that damage. And so are those whose support made this possible. Of course, the NIH and the foundation begun 50 years ago by a man named Paul Glenn. Now, Paul's field is investment, but his passion is investing in health. The question he helped answer in Bruce's lab has suddenly opened up an entirely new approach to a very frightening disease. So Bruce, would you stand and let's applaud both Bruce and Paul Glenn. So another question revolved around a critical global health issue that reminded us that not everything happens in labs. Take Rwanda. After the 1994 genocide, Rwanda was in chaos. How could health care be provided to the millions who needed help? And people came to Paul Farmer, HMS graduate, rock star medical anthropologist, and distinguished physician on our faculty. Paul and his team found answers. They designed programs, and they saved lives. The probability of a Rwandan child dying by age five dropped 70% between 2000 in 2012. And now Paul is helping to map out the world's response to Ebola. Paul, would you stand? <laughs> so we do great things here every day. But there's another challenge we face today. Even at Harvard, this pulsing ecosystem of energized people able to educate, innovate, and discover. Yes, even at Harvard, we cannot fund everything we should and must. Fifteen years ago, NIH provided a steady stream of dollars for worthwhile ideas, but not since 2003. Since then, in real dollars, NIH funding has gone down every year. And there isn't a day when I don't see a proposal of some kind on my desk that promises to illuminate our understanding of some fundamental process, or even save lives. Except for one thing, it probably won't get funded. So let me tell you one story about how we've handled that at Harvard. We see two roads to discovery, at least two roads. One belongs to those looking for cures. These faculty might ask, for example, can we develop a vaccine to prevent Ebola? And of course, this is vital and necessary work. But there's also a second road, fundamental science. These faculty ask, how does a cell divide, or signal to another cell, or die? Sometimes people call this curiosity-driven science. Now, for all the differences between these two approaches, both are essential. Now, if you ask me, at this point in my life, which in the long run will bring more cures, I truly think fundamental science will. But these scientists could do a better job of envisioning and then demonstrating the practical applications of their work. And that's why a few years back we asked, what about creating a lab that did both, that focused on the therapeutic possibilities of fundamental research? We were very, very excited about that, but we needed some startup money. And for a while, we couldn't find it. And it looked like we might actually have to give up. Then. We talked to the wonderful family of a man named Giovanni Armanese. 
he had come from Italy to Harvard hospitals, hoping that we could help his ailing wife. And eventually, she couldn't be saved. But he was grateful to the Harvard doctors who had treated her and to the medical school of which they were proud to be faculty. And he gave us one of the largest gifts in the school's history. What made that gift extraordinarily insightful as well as generous is that he directed the funds to support basic biomedical research. Now, that was nearly two decades ago, and Count Armanese sadly passed away last year. But this year, this spring, I asked his son, Gempero, whether he would support this new program that I just described. And he listened, he asked many questions, and then he said yes. You know the first building on the left when you face the quad from Longwood Avenue? That's the Armanese building, and that's where you'll find what we call the Harvard Program in Therapeutic Science. And I only wish we had Count Armanese, Nino, as I came to know him, here today to tell him personally what we feel. Immense gratitude. For this would not have happened except for the generosity of a family who, after losing the life of one they loved, made possible a project that will someday give life to others. But now let me tell you another story about a gathering crisis in American medicine, primary care. I spoke earlier about the pressures on young clinicians to choose a specialty. Very clearly, too few young trainees choose primary care. Primary care docs play a critical role on the front line of health care. But within 10 years, the US will be short 45,000 primary care doctors. So we need to produce more. We need to train them better. And we need to excite them about being on those front lines. Several years ago, one donor stepped forward to help make primary care a strategic priority at Harvard Medical School. And he didn't just give us resources. He's involved. We give him regular reports. We meet with him. He just doesn't want anyone to know his name. But he's the one responsible for the Harvard Medical School Center for Primary Care. We have great directors of the center and a dynamic team. And they're inspiring and training future leaders in primary care and pioneering new ways to design health care systems. Last year, one student talked about why she's so thrilled that we have this center. Helen Dakoto wanted to work with people who need care most and get at least. But sometimes students take a long time to find the program they want. So we set up an event, a little like speed dating. Students could go from one distinguished faculty member to the next looking for a mentor. And after one single session, Helen had a match. The center was designing a home for asthmatic kids. And she went on home visits. She shadowed her mentor. She wrote papers. One of the best experiences I've ever had, she said. Helen, would you stand? <laughs> so Helen is grateful to many people. One is our donor. She doesn't know his name, but she knows firsthand the way he has influenced her life and the lives of our patients. Thank you, Helen. Now let me be quick to say, most great discoveries don't come from lone scientists working totally by themselves, what historians call the myth of the lone inventor. To paraphrase Isaac Newton, we stand on the shoulders of others. Let me be also quick to say that we don't see results overnight, although we'd love to. After all, tomorrow is the 348th anniversary of the world's first successful blood transfusion. That's right. November 14th, 1666, and we're still working on doing that better. <laughs> Let me also be quick to say that, unfortunately, research, even the best research, doesn't always succeed. Even when our insights into a puzzle are correct, they don't always result directly in a therapy. Now, why is that? Because we're missing another part of the puzzle. So take an area of my own research, obesity. We know infinitely more today about the causes of obesity than when I was a student. But now, there are three times more Americans who are obese. It turns out that despite our insights, and they are major, powerful insights, obesity is more complex than we imagined and anticipated. So we need to continue our efforts and to understand more. And we need to be patient, too, because we don't always succeed right away, usually. But now let me go back for a moment to that night when I sat waiting for my data. The sheets slid out of the machine, and I looked and was sure I'd gotten it wrong. No, the data didn't look wrong. It looked good. In fact, it looked too good. I took the sheets home, 
And I thought I'd see my mistake when I woke up the next morning. But that morning, when I took the data to my NIH mentor, he looked, he listened, he asked a bunch of questions, and then he said, Jeff, I think you found the answer. So sometimes we do get lucky. Dr. Saul Burson, my first medical school mentor, had set me on the most intoxicating road that I could possibly imagine. Now, sadly, the lifetime of friendship and counsel that I'd hoped for was not to be, because he, who had helped so many, died too young. But Saul Burson did leave a legacy, and that legacy includes what happened to me on that magical night. And today, our distinguished faculty, many of whom are in the room, are privileged to leave legacies too. They train hundreds of young people who are working and hoping for the same kind of magical moment. We ask you to share that privilege with us. We ask you, our faculty, our funders, people we hope will become our funders, to leave your own legacy. It might be understanding the causes of Alzheimer's disease, cancer, or diabetes. It might be helping solve the crisis in primary care. It might be restoring the healthcare systems in West Africa or our own country. Be part of our team, just like the Patriots, the Celtics, the Bruins, and the Sox. Every player counts. So I ask you to become a player. Today, in every building, down every hallway, in every lab, I see young medical and research students dreaming what I dreamed. And in many cases, all they need is one person with the resources to help. You can be that person. You can help a researcher with an idea about enhancing medical care around the world or around the corner. You can be the person whose resources permit someone in a lab here to answer the question, why do nerve cells die? Or why do cancer cells die? Or why do they proliferate? You can be the person to help a student like Helen Dakota treat a vulnerable, asthmatic kid and discover what she wants to do with the rest of her professional life. You can be a person like Giovanni Armanese with the means to create a building where people unlock the mysteries of a cell, find cures for those who are sick, give life to those who would die. Join us. Become part of our team. There isn't a day that I don't cherish the gift that Burson, Dr. Burson gave to me. You will discover that gift by a gift that you present to our students. Offer your hand, offer your help, so we can enter this third century of Harvard Medical School poised to contribute not just discoveries, but doctors. Not just health, but hope to a world waiting, indeed hungering, for what our partnership can provide. Thank you very much.